This is Mining Stock Education, and I'm Bill Powers. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in. Well, about a month ago, I spent a few days in Nevada, and if you listen to every episode, you know that. And one of the gentlemen I was able to spend time with was Brian Lenny of JuniorStockReview.com. Brian is a full-time uh, mining stock investor and newsletter writer, and I'm, I've talked to him a few times over the last uh, year, year and a half, and I'm always impressed with the due diligence that he puts into analyzing his potential investments. He takes it extremely seriously because this is the means by which he provides for his family as a full-time uh, mining investor. With that being said, Brian, welcome back onto the show. And for those uh, listeners that haven't listened to our previous interviews, could you give a quick bio of how you got to be in this place where you're investing in junior mining stocks full-time? Sure. And thanks for having me, Bill. Um, so I'm an engineer by trade, uh, right out of school. I got started in the steel manufacturing industry, um, a process engineer, and then I went into management. Um, as I kind of went through uh, and started making money, um, I became an investor. And specifically, I was attracted to gold first. And it kind of trickled down into the uh, junior resource companies. Um, and in 2013, um, I took a giant step with the market kind of you know, imploding, um, I decided to sell my house and I took two thirds of the equity and I put it into what I thought were the best junior companies um, over 2014 and 2015. And then in 2016, I was paid back for my courage and I guess my good picks and my portfolio went up around 300%. And from there, I decided to leave my career and pursue investing full time. And uh, so since Basically, mid-2016, I've been a full-time investor in the resource sector, and I've been writing about what I invest in the market. And that's where I am today with Junior Stock Review. As I mentioned, your due diligence process is quite thorough, and you have the ultimate skin, skin in the game, as I said, with uh, your success uh, funding. your It's your income. So one of your recent write-ups was O3 Mining. Can you, for listeners that aren't aware, can you give us a, an overview of your, your analysis of this company? Sure. Uh, so O3 Mining is, is, is my top pick at the moment. Um, and it's centered around three main points. So I'll go through those. Um, so first and foremost, O3 Mining is actually the third iteration of the Cisco Mining Group. And for those that don't know, um, Cisco has been you know, serially successful in the business. Um, they started off with the Canadian Large Mine, which is the largest producing gold mine in Canada right now. Um, second, they brought uh, their windfall project to a feasibility study level, and that's, that's occurring right now. And, and I believe it's going to be the next producing asset in Quebec. And then now we jump into O3, and that's, that's where um, they've, they've placed their future and where I think is going to be their next success. Um, so first, it starts off with people and that serial successful uh, track record. Second, uh, when you look at the market cap versus the intrinsic value of O3, uh, in my opinion, they're trading for less than half of what they're, they should be valued at. And how you go through that, they've got roughly 30 million in cash. They've uh, purchased, uh, I think it's we're up to four properties now across the Valdor uh, region. And so this is about the east part of the Abitibi Greenstone Belt. Um, if you add up the value of those purchases and the value of their, their RTO spin out from a Cisco mining, um, you have roughly, let's say, $100 million plus the assets they bought since then. And that's those four uh, core pieces. And that's Alexandria, um, Chalice, um, and I forget what the third, third one is called, but um, you've got three of them. And so right there, you have roughly $20 million, I think, in uh, spending. You add that up and you get just over $200 million in market cap. And right now, they're currently trading for around 100. So you've got nice downside risk. And the primary upside that you see coming from this investment, is it from them furthering this project and expanding the resources? Exactly. And that, that comes... Uh, these guys are able to uh, raise money uh, through charitable flow through. And for those that don't know, charitable flow through is at an even higher ratio than regular flow through to the actual market price. You know, so they've, they've raised $10 million uh, in the last three or four months, and they're going to use that for 50,000 meter drill program over the next, you know, it's probably has another eight months to go in the, the program. So yeah, this is a, this is a high end drill play. As far as I'm concerned, they're drilling Marban, they're drilling their, the Bulldog area, which is formerly Alexandria, and then uh, they're East Valdor, which is the Chalice property. 
and it's around uh, the Chimo line. Um, I, I think it's highly prospective, and first and foremost, like I said, I think it has great downside risk, even outside of the upside that's from the drilling. In the last six months or five months, there has been a, a downward trajectory in the share price. Do you think that has to do primarily with the sector overall, or does it have to do with the sell-off that occurred in Osisco Royalty as a result of them uh, purchasing Barkerville? Um, actually, you know what, if, if I were to guess, I would say that the selling that you're, you're seeing is directly from those three purchases they made. So in buying um, Chalice, Alexandria, and again, I'm drawing a blank on the third one, but those were all share deals. And that's another advantage. These, uh, these purchases were made at three, $3.88 or dollars per share of a Cisco uh, or, th- or Vo3. And uh, what I think you're seeing is shareholders that had these companies are selling their shares off into the market and uh, putting that downwards pressure. And that's mixing with the tax loss selling that, you know, has kind of plagued most of the companies in the junior sector. So on this investment, if you had to choose between the jockey and the horse, the management team or the project, you'd be betting on the jockey here, right? I think so. But the other side to that, I think the properties are A-list too. And uh, that's why, you know, it's it's my top pick and it's my number one position in my portfolio, um, because I think you get both. But yes, I, I would agree if you had to pick, I would say it's a people play for sure. And if I recall correctly from our conversations in Nevada a few weeks ago, uh, this is your favorite jurisdiction, correct? Yeah, I really like it. I've got a, a soft spot for the Abitibi, especially after visiting there in August. But my in saying that, you know, Bill, that time we spend in Nevada, you know, that is a premier jurisdiction and I like it more and more the more times I go back. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Silver One Resources is an exploration and development company backed by strategic investors Eric Sprott and SSR Mining. The company is focused on its Candelaria Mine project in Nevada, where there is already a historic resource estimated at 127 million ounces of silver. The Candelaria Mine historically was the highest grade silver producer in Nevada, generating over 68 million ounces of silver at an amazing average production rate of over 1,250 grams per ton. The project has Tremendous expansion potential as past drilling has outlined deeper, high-grade silver targets for future drill programs. Silver One is highly leveraged to the price of silver and is cashed up and poised to increase shareholder value. Silver One trades in New York under the ticker SLVRF and in Toronto under the ticker SVE. To learn more, go to SilverOne.com. That's SilverOne.com. So let's talk entry points. With your approach to mining investments, uh, talk to us about how you discern an entry point. So you're spending hours a day in front of the computer. Um, you're, you're going across uh, mining investments. You go to several conferences over the year. Once you something makes it on your list of potential investments, your watch list, how do you discern things like seasonality? When was the last private placement? Expected liquidity? What are the things that go into you discerning what your entry point will be? So in terms of, I think the first thing that I do is try to establish what the value of the company is. And then from establishing the value, I compare that to what it's actually trading at. So you want to take a look at, you know, that downside risk. Like I I went through with O3, it's basically, you know, add up everything that the the company has versus what it's trading at. And then to me, if you see a company such as O3 that's trading at half of its value, I'm not totally concerned about the actual price that I buy it at. From there, I look at you know strength in the market. I look at level two market data and, and see you know the, the bids and the asks and, and kind of measure where I think the strength is. Um, and then I, I'm, I really try to be patient and buy it in tranches. So um, seasonality doesn't really have a whole lot to do with my decision unless I think the only thing that I think you can depend on typically is tax loss selling um, in Canada. Um, but other than that, I don't really play any seasonality with the metal price or anything like that. It just basically where's the value of the company versus where it's, it's trading at. And then from there, um, what do I think is going on in the market? Is it something that I need to be very patient and let it come to me? Or do I see a lot of strength in that share price? And am I willing to buy right now? You're an engineer by trade, uh, which means you rely more on analysis than emotions, I would say, generally speaking. But have you ever bought just based off a quick back of the napkin calculation? Have you bought a significant position based on a quick you know, due diligence process? Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> can you give an example? Sure. I'll, 
So actually, when I was in uh, Val d'Or um, in the beginning of August, we went to see three companies. On the third day, we saw Radisson Mining. And so I listened to their presentation. And then most key, I listened to their structural geologists go through their model. And uh, I was I, so I'd heard the story and then we got into the technicals and I, like, I listened to how they formed the model and exactly how they were targeting. And, uh, you know, drilling was was basically happening right right there. The next week they were going to start drilling. And uh, I looked at my level two data on my cell phone. And uh, as we were walking into the field, I bought um, a pretty good sized tranche in the company. And it, it ended up being really good for me because I bought it at, I think it was trading for, let's say, 13 or 14 cents. And within a couple of weeks, it shot up over 20 cents. And actually, what I did is I sold it. And it was nothing to do with the company, but I was able to get close to a 50% um, profit and take no risk from the drill program. And in, in my world, that is a great return on basically, you know, not taking any risk. So I took it. Every time I talk to you, you seem to be well tuned in to the marketers or promoters behind uh, different companies. Talk about what role does in your due diligence before you buy a company does analyzing who's promoting the stock play? It has a lot to do with it. And you know, when, when people talk about people, 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 like you really need to have a good handle of who you're dealing with. And uh, I think first and foremost for me, it's trying to understand how serious these guys are about actually you know, adding value or, you know, you creating a mind in the future. Once I understand what the motivations or what I believe there are the motivations behind the company or behind the people in the company, um, then I can decide how I want to play that. And for me, it's not one straight thing where if I don't like the promoters, uh, I'm not going to invest. I don't really do that. It's just basically where I think I can make profit. And sometimes it's a short term trade. Sometimes it's not investing at all. Um, and then other times when I really like the people, I want to take a really good position. I want to visit the, the property and I want to get to know those people as well as I can. And uh, I think every investor, you know, it'll pay huge dividends. And this is why, again, you need to go to conferences and stuff, meet these people, learn their backgrounds, you know, find out who they're connected to, who are the lead orders in their private placements. A lot of this will kind of tell you the motivations behind that company. And I think it will make you more successful. Before you invest in a new company and a new investment, how thoroughly do you think through your exit strategy in advance? I have a pretty good, you know, it, it really depends. <laughs> for, uh, especially for short-term trades, I know exactly the price I want to sell at. And I'll most of the time enter a sell order as soon as I bought it. Um, the long-term trades, I'm kind of following, you know, I, I'm looking for, usually I've got, you know, three or four catalysts that I think are going to occur over a certain amount of time. And I'm watching how those catalysts come in. Like if they're, am I getting yes answers on each of these? Um, how does the next question form? And do I think that upside is still intact? Um, so in those cases, I might have a general idea of where I think I want to sell or where, uh, my exit point might be, but it's not set in concrete. But the short-term positions, yeah, absolutely. I've got a, an exact sell price and it's usually entered as soon as I buy it. For the long-term positions, do you have like a five-bagger potential minimum, something like that, that you work with? Uh, no, I don't actually. I, I, I definitely want to see, like, like you can talk about exploration companies and say target size. Yeah, absolutely. I want to look for companies that are exploring for something big. Uh, I don't think there's anything gained you know, really by looking for something small. Um, but in terms of like upside potential, I guess they play hand in hand, but I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily as concerned. Um, I'm looking again, quality people, um, pretty good uh, target size um, and, and project uh, value. And then from there, you know, I, I just, I suspect that, you know, that those things will probably at least have a five bigger potential. When you analyze exploration stocks, what are your minimum requirements for a potential investment uh, here? You know, I don't, you see it, for me, it always depends. Um, again, I, I like to see a large target size. Um, I think depending on what the target is, like if it's an epithermal gold, if it's a poor free target, I'm... I'll view it a little bit different in terms of how much cash the company has. You know, some of these uh, deposits, you, they need to have access to cash for them to be able to drill it and, you know, outline a, a proper project um, the way it needs to be. So, you know, I want to see access to cash. 
And again, that plays into what that target is and the target size. Um, but I don't have any set criteria that necessarily drops a company out. It gets, uh, you know, each one is different for me. What about this year, Brian, as you analyze the market and you're looking at the stock charts, you still think we have some harsh tax loss selling to come in the sector? If I were to guess, I'd say there's a higher probability that we're still going to see tax loss selling probably for another three weeks. Like that mid-December is kind of the point where I think if you're if you want to be a buyer, you're going to have to make a decision because I would suspect after the midpoint of December, there is a much higher probability that this market returns. Um, but of course, you know, trying to market time, I, I don't think there's any huge value in it because none of us can really tell with any consistency. Are you a buyer this tax loss season or are you pretty much set in your uh, positioning? A little bit of both. <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll put you this way. I'm pretty happy with where I am. Uh, in terms of new positions, I've been doing a ton of research over the last two weeks. I think I've covered about 35 companies. Um, I've got an idea of new, new positions that I may want to take depending on the price. Uh, but I've got a lot of stink bids in for existing uh, companies that I own. Um, but in saying that, if, like I said, I don't put a lot of stock into being able to time the market. So if I don't, if those things don't, you know, cover and I don't have the, the share prices and the market takes off, then I'm also happy with where I am. You're extremely bullish on nickel uh, and you also expect gold to go up, but are there any other commodities you got your eye on? Well, you know, one of the one of the companies that I've taken particular interest uh, in the last couple of weeks is primarily a zinc company. Um, and I think if you look at the valuations for many of the zinc companies, they've been, you know, killed over the last, especially the last six months. Like some of these valuations are crazy. Um, and but the other side to it is the one thing I like about the zinc, the zinc or most of the zinc deposits is they usually have a silver credit somewhere in there. And I think if you've got size and you've got a good uh, precious metal credit, um, I think there could be something there. So a few of the companies that I'm still kind of playing with the idea of buying um, have a precious metals upside to them. And I think we'll, or at least I think we'll balance in the future um, to, you know, to uh, be profitable. As you look back on 2019 and as we conclude here, uh, what's the biggest thing that you learned in your investing or what would be what you'd want to do most differently? You know what, for me, it's just continuously working on myself, whether it's further education into geology or metallurgy, but probably even the biggest part is just to keep a good handle on myself and control of my emotion. I, I think you kind of touched on it. I think my background leads me to be more logical or more, uh, you know, quantitative based in my analysis. But I still like I keep a journal of, of how my trading is going and where I made mistakes. And I continually, when I make mistakes, it's it's because of emotion. So I, I typically, um, or I need to be better at that moving forward. And uh, I guess it's a continuous improvement process. Brian's website is juniorstockreview.com. Go there, make sure you're on Brian's email list. He has a lot of excellent um, write-ups. You can see companies that he's invested in and his thorough due diligence is put forth in writing on his website. Again, get on his email list. Brian, as always, I appreciate your insights. Thanks for coming on Mining Stock Education. Thanks for having me, Bill. Thank you for listening to this Mining Stock Education podcast. Please subscribe and share with like-minded investors. Visit us on the web at miningstockeducation.com for more resources on precious metals and natural resource investing. At our website, you can also sign up for our free newsletter for interview transcripts, stock picks, and more.